In today's rapidly changing world, we all have questions and we all want answers. It's on this program that we get our answers from the Word of God. It's time for another episode of A Relevant Word with longtime pastor and best selling author Carl Gallup. Welcome to another Relevant Word with Pastor Carl Gallops of the Pensacola, Florida area. I'm Kevin King, and today we're going to talk about words that could mean a couple of different things and how, how it makes it relevant in the Bible to our daily lives. It's kind of like the word, um, Carl, maybe lazy. Mm-hmm. Right? It, can mm-hmm. mean, it can mean, I can think of three things right now. It can mean, yeah. Carl, you're lazy, but yeah. you're not. Yeah, you know? But I'm not, thank or, you. Or, or, or it could mean like... <laughs> Wait a minute, I take offense at that. (laughs) You're from a lazy little town, which is a nice place to be. Uh Or it could be, get out of your lazy chair. There you go. Whatever. But but you've got to, in in, in the old biblical writings and and the Hebrew and in the Greek, you've got words that you're going to bring to make them relevant to us today. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, words have nuances, and sometimes Mm -hmm. those nuances change everything. And and that's one of the difficulties. Let me just add this little extra for our folks here. And by the way, thank you guys for listening. But it 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 the nuances are the dif- that those are the things that are the difficulties of translations. You know, when 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 people come to the the Hebrew in the Old Testament primarily, the Greek and the New Testament, and they're translating words into our language, but not just our language, but meaning. What does it mean in its depth? And then trying to figure out the context and the nuances of those. Those words. So anyway, so that's what we're going to do today. So please don't turn this off. I know some of you are thinking, wait a minute, I don't want to do some deep word study of the Hebrew and the Greek. Well, guess what? We're going to. But listen, please hear me. It's going to be fun. You will see. But more than any of that, it will bring the word of God alive for you. You're going to see some things after this. What you see in your mind's eye, you won't be able to unsee ever again. And so when you come to the scriptures, you will see this over and over throughout the scriptures. You will see the understanding of this. And then, but more, even more importantly than that, this is going to be very, very intimately relevant for your own life. I promise you. So hang in here with me. We're going to go to school for just a little bit. We're going to go to, to seminary for just a little bit. I wish I had a bell. I wish mm-hmm. I had yeah, a bell. Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah, I think it sound like a school bell. Session. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> like ding, ding. But anyway, well, well, hang in here with me, folks. Truly, I, I think you will enjoy this, and especially when you understand the relevance of all of this. Now, here's what I want to do. I want to take the English word temple, okay? Temple. And we find that word in the Old Testament, of course. And immediately we think of, sometimes we think of some of the pagan temples that are mentioned in the Old Testament. But more importantly, we think of the temple of God, of course, on the Temple Mount. Uh, and so that word is throughout. And it's found in various forms, uh, just like the way we have several different phrases or words for uh, that mean the same thing, synonyms, if you will. But when we open our Bibles in the English translations and we come to the Old Testament, we often see the word temple. And I'm going to tell you what those words beneath the English text are, what they are in the Hebrew in just a moment. But it's the same thing when we come to the New Testament, which was written primarily in Greek. And you'll see the word temple throughout, of course, in the New Testament, all the way into the book of Revelation. And again, that word has nuances. And the point is, it's more than nuances. Each, the Hebrew, there are two specific words that have a nuance of meaning, but those two words are usually only translated as the one word in English, temple. But the problem is, is that even though it says temple in the English, it says one or the other of two words in the Hebrew. Same thing with the Greek. And when you understand the differences between those two and the nuances of their interpretation, uh, it, it just it, it blows your mind. All right, so hang on. Now, I've said a lot of that. Let me get into the nuts and bolts of this. And thank you for listening again and staying with me on this. So let's go to the Hebrew first. So when we come to the Hebrew uh, scriptures, Genesis through Malachi, and we come across the word temple, sometimes, and I don't want to get deep into this, but sometimes that word has been inserted by the translators. Sometimes, and that's found in the book of Daniel a couple of times, the word temple is not there at all. It's not even there in the Hebrew. 
It's just there's a description in the text that the that the sometimes the scholars think, well, they, it must be talking about the temple, so we'll insert that word. Okay, well, that's a shame when when translations do that. I, I like the more literal translations, but there you do see the English word temple in the Old Testament. But here's the deal: that word in the Hebrew. There are two specific words that are often translated as temple. Uh, one of them is hekal, and you could, I'm just phonetically H E Y K A L, if you will, hekal. All right. That word means the temple, the temple edifice, the structure, the house, if you will, uh, that, that houses everything in, uh, in it, the, the hekal. And that could be used for a pagan temple. You could speak of the hekal of Dagon, if you wanted, or the hekal of Baal or something. Uh, but, but m- most of the time in the Old Testament, it's the hekal. It's the temple on the temple mounts, the one that Solomon built, the temple building, the temple structure. Okay. Now that's important. Hekal. But there's also another term, mikdash, and often in the New Testament, you'll just see it, excuse me, in the Old Testament, in the English, you'll just see it translated temple. So either way, you when you open your English translations and you find the word temple, you just assume that it always means the same thing, but it really doesn't. You have to know the nuances. So mikdash is the second word that I want to introduce you to. There's hekal, the temple building And then there's Mikdash. Now, Mikdash speaks of something that is very, very holy. And it it refers to almost always in the Old Testament, the holy of holies in the temple. So in other words, the Hekal is the house that surrounds or houses, if you will, the Mikdash. The Holy of Holies. We know that that's behind the curtain, right? And the Ark of the Covenant was there, etc. All right, so you've got the Holy of Holies, the Mikdash, and then the building that surrounds it and protects it and houses it is called the Hekah. But when you come to the English translations, almost always either one of those words is translated as temple. And that's okay because they, the Mikdash is in the Hekah, and the mikdash is the reason the hekal exists. So they they are almost synonymous, but there's a nuance. Now, hang on. In case you think I'm stretching this too much and, and nitpicking too much, I'm not. I promise you will see in just a moment. Okay. Now, in the Greek, there are words that mean the very same thing. There are synonyms, if you will, of hekal and mikdash. And that is hieron in the Greek, which means the building that would be equivalent to the hekal, or the naos. N-A-O-S, the naos, of, of, and, and, and that would be synonymous to mikdash. In other words, that's the holy of holies. All right, and it's the same thing. The he Aran houses the naos. But when you come to the New Testament, you will see the word temple used repeatedly, and sometimes it is he Aran, sometimes it's naos. All right, now again, you might be thinking, well, what, what's the big deal? I mean, you know, you're making a really big deal out of these two different words. Well, there are two diff- they are two different words for a reason. But let me go back to the Hebrew for just a moment. This is where it starts getting interesting. So, again, when you speak of the temple structure, hekal, 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 it's all through the Old Testament. I actually taught this one time, Kevin, and there was a Hebrew guy in the audience that was actually had been to Hebrew school all of his life, came from a Hebrew, a Jewish family. And when it was over, he said, well, I think I've learned some things. I said, what do you mean you think? He said, well, I've never even heard the word hekal before. I said, you got to be kidding. He said, no, but he said, but I'm going to go look it up. I said, well, you're going to find it everywhere in the Old Testament. So he looked it up, and sure enough, he called me back. He said, you're right. It's everywhere. And he said, but I never learned it because all of my life and for 2,000 years, there has not been a hekal on the Temple Mount in downtown Jerusalem. So we really had no reason to even talk about it. Yeah, so 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 he's listening to this. Here I am, this English speaking guy that happens to know you know quite a bit of Hebrew, but here he is raised in it, and he's thinking, This guy doesn't know what he's talking about. There's no Hebrew word called a Hekal until he looked it up and he saw his words. It's everywhere in the Old Testament. Yes, because it's speaking of the temple edifice on the Temple Mount. But now let's go back to Mikdash, because that's the holy of holies. Now that literally means the it's forgive me for being redundant literally means the literal holy of holy place in the hekal 
But it also has the understanding of just a place of holiness. There's something very spiritual about it as well as a physical locality. All right, now, so we find the nickname in the Old Testament for the Mikdash. We find it 16 times. 11 times it's found in 1 Kings. Five times it's found in 2 Chronicles. One time it's found in Psalm 28, 2. Now, you're listening to this right now. Um, you can maybe turn to Psalm 28, 2, either now or sometime later, and you can see it. But in the English, it won't say temple. It will say something like the, sac- the sacred place or the sanctified place or the most holy place or something like that. And in, in, in Psalm uh, 28, verse 2, uh, King David is saying, listen, I, 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 I'm praying, I'm lifting up my hands, I'm turning towards, I'm praying towards, and then this word is used, the deber, deber, that is a synonym of Migdash, the holy place, but it has a very important nuance to the to the understanding and to the meaning of it. The word deber in Hebrew means the word. It's interesting. And it can also mean the thing. And you say, well, how can it mean the word and the thing? Because here's the meaning of it. It is the word that speaks forth and a thing happens. For example, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the deep. And then God said, he spoke, let there be light. And the thing called light was born. The word, de bear, that brings forth a thing. And that is the nickname for the mikdash in Hebrew and for the naos in the Greek. Now, in just a moment, we're going to take a quick break. When we get back, I'm going to show you how intimately connected all of this is and relevant to your own life. And there's still some more stunning revelations. Thank you, Carl. This is interesting. We're going to school today. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> more of A Relevant Word will return after the break. For more on Pastor Carl or to listen to his podcast anytime, visit carlgallops.com. For more on Pastor Carl or to listen to his podcast anytime, visit carlgallops.com. Welcome back to A Relevant Word with Pastor Carl Gallops. And we're uh, going back to grammar school, but specifically Hebrew and Greek school. And uh, we've learned a lot in the first segment, but now... How is it relevant to our everyday life, Carl? Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, that's where I'm going, and because I, and and again, thanks for hanging in here with me because I, I, I this is so important what I'm going to teach you. And as I said, once you see it in in your mind's eye, you'll never be able to unsee it. And and the scriptures will just really speak powerfully to you and to your own life. So let me continue. So just as a quick review, in the Old Testament Hebrew, Hekal means the temple structure that's on top of the temple mount. Of course, that doesn't, it's not there anymore. It hadn't been there for almost 2,000 years. But that was Solomon's temple and then the rebuilt temple and then Herod's temple, if you will, the adding to the rebuilt temple. All right, the Hekal, the temple structure on the temple mount. But what was inside that structure that was so important? Well, it was the holy place, the most holy place, the holy of holies. That's where the Ark of the Covenant was. It was behind the veil and only the high priest could go in and only once a year. Okay, now that is called the mikdash in Hebrew. And as I said, the Greek words that correspond are he aron, that would be like hekal, the building, and then naos, that would be like mikdash, the holy of holies, the holiest place of God. Okay, but right before we went to the break, I was telling you that there is a word used, it's kind of a nickname, if you will, for the Mikdash in the Old Testament, used 16 times, and I told you in that, in that segment where they were, um, and, and it is a synonym for, or a nickname for the Mikdash, for the Holy of Holies. It's called the Deber, Deber. 
in Hebrew. And it means the word, but it's a holy word. It's the holy word of God. In fact, when you look in the Old Testament and you see the phrase in the English, and the word of the, and the, word of the Lord came unto Moses and said, well, in Hebrew, it says the day bear of Adonai came unto Moses. The day bear. Okay. Why? Because it's the word of God. Well, why is that so important? Why is that separate from any other word? Because that's the word that God speaks in the creation account. He says he spoke and he said, let there be, and it was. And even in today's modern Hebrew, the word deber means basically the thing, but it also means the word, the word of God. Even in synagogues, a, a, a lot of the uh, the synagogues are arranged, I think maybe all of them uh, are arranged so that the people are facing the word of God, the scrolls, if you will. Uh, they're facing the day bear, and there's a name they have for it that uses that word day bear in it. And so that, that word still lives today, but you do find it in the Old Testament. All right, now, so what's important about it? All right, now remember Deber can also be a synonym for naos in the Greek, because naos and mikdash mean the very same thing. So, therefore, Deber is a nickname for mikdash, so it can be a nickname, a Hebrew nickname for the Greek naos. Now that you know that, watch this. Think of the first few verses of the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the word. Well, in most English translations, that's capitalized. Why? Well, the Greek word is logos, but it carries the same idea. You could say in the Hebrew, in the beginning was the day bear, and the day bear was with God, and the day bear was God. And then you go down to verse 14, and the day bear took upon flesh and dwelt among us, and in him we saw the glory of the one and only, the begotten of the Father. Now, think about that for just a moment. I'm going to make this real personal in a moment, but already it's bringing the word alive because now we know this, this nebulous word, word with the capital W in the English. We, some people say, well, I know the Greek. That's logos. Well, what does that mean? It means the eternal word or the word that's spoken and something happens. Oh, wow. Well, that's a synonym of Deber in the Hebrew. Okay. And that word Deber is actually used 16 times in the Old Testament to describe that place with inside the temple. But by the time, as I said, you get to John, it opens up by saying in the beginning was the holy word place. You could actually, Deber could actually mean the holy word place, if you will, the place where God speaks. Who does he speak to? Well, to the, to the high priest once a year. And the high priest comes out, watch this, he comes out in the flesh, he's a man, but he's the high priest, he speaks to the people what God has spoken to him. So it's the word that becomes flesh in the form of the high priest, but all of that is a picture of Jesus himself coming from the holiest place, that is, from behind the veil of time. He has always been on his throne. He, God, appears in the flesh as Emmanuel, God with us, or Yeshua, our salvation, or it comes out as in English as Jesus. He appears in the flesh as Jesus. He is the Word. He is the Word that became flesh and dwelt among us. He is our great high priest. He is the Word that became flesh and he is the Word of God. He is the living Word of God. Okay, so now that really beefs up and brings alive a whole lot of the Scriptures, but now let's go right to us. Remember the nuances in the Greek. He, Iran, that's the same as Hekal. Naos, that's the same as Mikdash in the Hebrew. Or you can borrow the nickname from Mikdash, Thebar, and that would be the same nickname for Naos. Why is that important? Now let's go to Paul's writings. He writes almost one half of the New Testament. He uses the word, and you'll find it in the English translations, temple. I don't know, 11 or 12 times. I should have counted them. So if somebody goes and counts them and it's a little off one way or the other, please forgive me. But it's a, let's just say around 10 or 11 times, you'll find in his writings the word temple. But if you do an, an understudy of it, go, go to the underlying, underlying Greek, you will discover that only once 
does he use the word he aran? And it's in one of the Corinthians, I can't remember, it's first or second Corinthians, where he's talking about as an illustration. He says, Now when the priests go up to the he aran to conduct their duties, and then he goes on with his illustration. But every other time Paul speaks of the temple, it's always the word naos. Well, why is he using that word? Because he never actually speaks of the literal holy of holies behind the curtain when he uses it. Well, how does he use it? Watch this. He says to the church and to individual Christians over and over, I'll give you just a few examples, but again, there are nine or ten more, but I can think of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, where he's speaking to the church at Corinth, and he says, don't you know, you are the naos of God. You, the church, you are the naos. You are the most holy place. Watch this. You are the the holy word place of God now. You are the body of Christ. That's why Jesus stood in the Gospel of John. He stood before the Pharisees, and he pointed to himself. He said, destroy this temple. That's what it says in the English. But in the Greek, it says, destroy this naos. See, he wasn't speaking of the temple he aran on the back. He says, you destroy this holy word place. I am the word that became flesh. What is in that temple has always represented me. It's about me. It's always been about me. And now here I am standing before you. Destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it again. <laughs> so, so you see, so when Paul is then later writing, after the resurrection of the ascension of Jesus, the birth of the church, Paul's like the bishop of all the churches around. Now he is saying to the church at Corinth particularly, he said, don't you understand? You are the naos now. You're the holy word place. What's that? From out of the church, from out of God's people, from out of the called out ones is supposed to now come the holy word of God. And often when we speak it, if we speak it according to his will and in the name of Jesus, it happens. <laughs> it's the word that makes something happen. And that's us, he says, the church. You're the nose. You're the nose. Here's another one. First Corinthians chapter 6, he says, now listen, he says, avoid sexual immorality at all costs. Flee from sexual immorality. He said, all other sin is outside the body, but this one is inside the body. In other words, he's saying, it affects your mind, your heart, your soul. It affects everything. And he says, and don't you know that your body is the, and the English says, temple of God, and a lot of people just squish that down and make it, yes, my body's a temple. I'm going to eat good food because, you know, my body's a temple. And i, I got to take care of myself. i got to look good because my body's the temple. That's not what it means. He says, don't you know, flee from sexual immorality because don't you know that your body is the holy word place of God and the Holy Spirit dwells within you and you are not your own. You are bought with a price. You see the difference, Kevin? Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, it's very holy, very powerful. We keep moving on. First John chapter 5, I think it is, where he says, don't you know the word of God? That's the logos, or in the, in the Hebrew, the day bear of God lives within you. The holy word place of God lives within you. That's why Paul writes and he says, listen, study to show yourself approved, able to accurately handle the word of God. That's why Paul says we are ambassadors of Jesus Christ. Why is that? Well, what does the ambassador do? He represents the king. When the ambassador speaks the word, it's as though the king is speaking it. And if he speaks it correctly in the name of the king, whatever he speaks gets done in the name of the king. It happens. And Paul says, we're the ambassadors for the King of kings, the Lord of lords. We are the holy word place of God. I mean, I mean, is this making sense, Kevin? It'll blow you away when you, once you see this, you can't unsee it. The entire teaching of the New Testament from the mouth of Jesus to the mouth of Paul and all the other writers speak over and over and over about who we are in Jesus Christ. And we are important. We are now the holy word place. Let the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart, you know, be, be acceptable, holy in your sight. Uh, thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. I will hide your word in my heart so that I might not sin against you. The day bear, the day bear, the day bear, the holy word place of God. It's us. It's amazing. It, it, uh, it sheds light on a whole new responsibility. Yeah, you know, you, you it know does. 
you, I've, I've heard the words, you're, you are the temple of, you know, your, your yeah. body is a temple yeah. of my, my whole yeah. life. And Therefore, eat your string beans now. Yeah, you're right. the temple of God. Yeah. <laughs> it has nothing to do with that, brother. No, I, <laughs> no that's, that is, uh, that's really interesting. I'm glad you brought that up today because uh, I, I've learned something and I'm sure our audience has also. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate, appreciate your kind words and I pray so. So, folks, thank you so much for listening. I pray that the Lord is with you and that he will bless you and keep you always. Now more than ever, we need to listen to God. He still speaks through His Word, the Bible. Each week, Pastor Gallups shares what the Word of God is saying, even now, a relevant word, with longtime pastor and best-selling author, Carl Gallups. To access Pastor Carl and to listen to his podcast anytime, visit carlgallups.com. Thanks for listening. Ladies and gentlemen, Prepare yourself for a brand new book from critically acclaimed best-selling author, Pastor Carl Gallup's The Yeshua Protocol, an explosion of divine revelation for our unique generation. Carl Gallup's takes you on a whirlwind tour through the scripture like you've never experienced. Discover the undeniable Yeshua codes buried within the pages of the Old Testament. Learn the inescapable reality that every living cell in creation is encoded with the very name of God. And be shocked when you see what has been secretly lying within the pages of the Bible. That allows you to see Yeshua as you've never before fathomed him. Yeshua Protocol mentions a wide variety of topics such as quantum physics, ancient Hebrew letter meanings, the latest archaeological finds, and Yahweh's name encoded upon our very own DNA. Do you really cover all of these topics in the book, The Yeshua Code? All of those and many more. Yeah. I mean, we're living in incredible times. And, and, you know, you speak of, for example, Internet technology and all that that entails. You know, I describe it as we are looking at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil.